Hello and welcome to the Director's Cut. I'm delighted to be in conversation with Tristram Hunt, the Director of the Victoria and Albert Museum London, or the VNA as it's popularly known. It defines itself as the world's leading museum of art, design, and performance. And I think many of us would agree. Its first director, Henry Cold, called it a refuge for destitute collections. It holds over 17 national collections ranging from photography, glass, ceramics, sculptures, textiles. And that is what probably makes it such an exciting collection to investigate, especially for curators. It reminds me of the collection we have at MAP, wandering off in different directions, but throwing up unexpected journeys for audiences. Tristram has been leading the museum for the last five years and through a particularly challenging time, there's been social, economic and political disruption triggered first by Brexit, followed by the pandemic, and then the movement against racial discrimination. But let's say he's equipped with a whole range of skills to deal with this and more. A former member of parliament, a scholar in Victorian history, a writer and television host for the BBC. His most recent book, The Radical Potter, was released during the pandemic. What's particularly interesting is the direction that Tristram is leading the VNA in, a multi-site museum where they are redesigning older spaces, but also creating new ones. And we are all very eager to see what the reimagining of this institution will be. Well, no more about Tristram's several accomplishments. We have a more detailed bio in the chat box that you can look up. We also have time for a few questions at the end, so do type them in on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens. I would also like to thank Abhishek for the ISL interpretation during our conversation. Welcome, Tristram, and thank you for speaking to us on the Director's Cut. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I'm sure you have dealt with the question of politician turned museum director endlessly. But what I would like to ask about are the learnings from your previous career that have helped you build on your role as a museum director. And I ask you this as a former journalist turned museum director. I think um, as, a, as a member of parliament and, and, and as a politician, you for all the fact that people say politicians are out of touch with, with the public, actually politicians um, who have constituencies, who go back to their constituencies every week, um, you know, they're in Westminster during the week and then back in their constituencies, have this strong connection with the communities they represent and the, the taxpayers they, they, they represent. So I think you, you do bring a strong idea of accountability uh, in terms of running a museum as a, as a previous politician, that what you are doing in South Kensington has to, as a national museum funded by UK taxpayers across the country, really has to work for the entire country. And so when we think about, you know, ensuring our collections are lent across the country, working on education programmes, thinking uh, about uh, conservation support for other museums, it's, it's that notion of accountability of the collection as well as ensuring everyone feels welcome here because I, I've, I've you know as a former politician you you know the families who are paying the taxes to help fund the institution um, and it's it's often quite an important reminder. Mm. That's looking out outside of the museum but what if you turn that spotlight inwards and also look at how do you manage the whole museum within as well does that does that as well help you know, it's, it's really about managing people, right? Besides looking after objects. It's exactly, as you know, it's exactly right. You think it's about objects, it's really about people. Um, and I think you do also, um, as, as a politician, understand the, the psychology of interests that are apparent in any um, organization. And as a, as a good politician, you're, you're, and I wasn't a great politician, but as a good politician, you, you have, an understanding of the importance of listening, the understanding of important of, you know, kind of mo mobilizing, um, you know, factions, groups behind an agenda, thinking about how you operate between the board of trustees, between colleagues, between staff. So some of the, the politics of, 
of, of the organization. There are some learnings from politics itself. And the VNA is a, is a you know, we're 950 people. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big organization. And, and I do think some of that, that, that psychological understanding you gain as a politician can also be useful. Yeah. So when you think of the VNA, you think design. In fact, the latest exhibition, Fashioning Masculinities, combines so many different elements. You have design, fashion, history, and that element of surprise, because you don't really expect a discussion, also an exhibition on men's fashion. So I would like you to talk to us about how design is very much at the core of what the VNA is all about, and how you are using it to inspire young people and education systems in the UK. So we, we describe ourselves as a museum of art, design and performance. And, and, and as you know, that space where art ends and design begins or even craft begins and art ends is, is, is constantly evolving. Um, but there's no doubt that fashion design uh, and, and, and our what used to be called our costume uh, collections are a really important part um, of what we do at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And so our Fashioning Masculinities exhibition, which really traces the art of menswear, as we call it, over the last 400 years and exploring ideas of masculinity through fashion and whether that was the great craze for pink in the 1500s or whether it was the retreat to the, the very austere um, sort of suits of the 1950s. You know, what, what these say about um, men shaping their own identity. Um, and it's a lovely exhibition because it explores it not only through fashion and costume, mm -hmm. but through portraiture, through photography, through film, uh, and then right up to some of the great kind of Oscar uh, installations um, of today. So design is really important. And young people, attracting young people into museums, we know that, design, that fashion design and photography are, are ways to bring them into the museum. And our hope is always that then they will discover jewellery and ceramics and glass and all those other components um, that, that, that we have within the museum. And in Britain, and I, I don't know the situation in India at the moment, we've had this really worrying fall in creative education within our school system within the last 15 years. So mm -hmm. the numbers taking art, music, drama, and particularly design and technology have fallen. And so the VNA was founded to support design. It was founded in the mid 19th century to encourage design and the teaching of design. So one of my big passions and projects is to ensure that we are working with schools around the country mm -hmm. to support teachers, curriculum, provide inspiration for young people to think about design and hopefully become designers of the future. I always say, you know, we want your artifacts in this museum in 10, 20 uh, years time. And so it's going back to our foundations but bring it up to date for what's needed now. Yeah, because I think the idea, even for in, in India, the challenge is how do you get people scattered all over in those rural areas, or for example, in your own constituency of Stoke-on-Trent, how do you get children there to come in, connect with the VNA, one day possibly think of working in the VNA? So I, th I think the challenge is to get people from all walks of life into the, into the museum space, right? And into the museum stream. Totally, and it and it and it's and it works both ways. So, for example, you know, we 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 have a collection just outside Stoke on Trent, the Wedgwood uh, collection, which we which we've touched on. And so, we're working with schools in Stoke on Trent to connect them to that history of ceramics, and then hopefully bring them down um, to South Kensington. It's a responsibility about sharing our collections around the country, working with schools, working with regional museums, but then also providing, frankly, the resource and the time and the space for young people from across the country to come to the museum. Because as you know, part of the wonder of this place isn't just the objects, it's the physical environment of South Kensington. It's an inspiring building with its own meaning. And, you know, it, it raises people's ambitions and aspirations and, uh, and, and they should feel like they own it. This, this very wonderful idea that our you mentioned Henry Cole, our first founder had, that all of this belongs to all of you, that this is a public collection, it is owned by you, you have a right to come in every day of the week and see it, um, and, and we have to give that feel right from the beginning. Yes, I, you know, even we are working so hard to make sure that the museum is really an accessible, inclusive space 
for everyone to come and where everyone feels they're welcome. Um, I would really like to come to the idea of the multi-site museum that the VNA is developing and that you must be absolutely consumed by. What is the thinking behind the concept, especially the VNA East, and what is the future that you see for the institution as a whole and for the public as a result of it? So for, over the next three years, uh, we, we will spread our wings um, from South Kensington um, and have sites um, in Dundee, in East London and um, in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, and really, that's a, an idea, you know, to the earlier point about ensuring as much public access to the collection as possible. But also each different compartment of this, this family of sites, these aren't franchises, these aren't, you know, McDonald's, uh, these are individual museums with their own ethos, the connection to their local communities, but drawing upon the mothership, uh, as it were, of of South Kensington in different ways. So Dundee is now the, the Scottish Design Museum. Um, it's the vehicle for promoting and thinking about design um, in Scotland um, and has helped lead the regeneration uh, of Tayside um, up in the northeast of Scotland. In East London, we're building a new storehouse facility uh, which will allow people um, to, to explore our reserve collection, to go and enjoy, um, you know, that, that age-old question, where have you hidden all the other stuff? Well, now they can go and see it for themselves. Um, at Young v &A, which was our Museum of Childhood in Bethnal Green, we're, we're transforming what was a museum of the social history of childhood um, into a space for encouraging creativity and nurturing uh, cultural confidence uh, amongst uh, uh, young people. So all of these facilities hopefully add up to um, an expanded v &A, but also true to its mission. And in many ways, it, it goes back to what the v &A in, in, in some forms used to do, because the VNA always used to look after some great historic houses, whether it was Wellington House or Ham House or these other sites outside of South Kensington. So we've we've grown and contracted uh, over the years, but over the coming years, uh, we're really excited to have um, these these new facilities available. And um, we're sharing something. I think we're trying to show them the new facilities. Oh, ah, okay. That that is. That's Kensington, of course, for our viewers, but would you like to move forward, uh, Shruti, and show us the next few images? Yeah, all of this is Kensington. Actually, should, do you want to walk people through this, Tristram? You should be doing that. Yeah, would you like? Yeah, if you, if you go back a couple, um, Shruti. Um, so this is, so this is the, 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 these are the front steps of, uh, of, of uh, South Kensington, which uh, uh, many of you will know. Next slide, please. Um, here we see, this was the original facade of the Victoria and Albert Museum back in the 18, uh, uh, 50s and 1860s. Uh, and and at, at the top, you see a, a celebration of the 1851 uh, Great Exhibition. Uh, and this was Albert's sort of big event in, Prince Albert's big event in Hyde Park from which the museum emerged. And then you have this absolutely glorious uh, red brick uh, architecture, Italianate um, architecture, which speaks to that sort of mid-Victorian uh, confident moment. What's wonderful about this space is that, uh, as it is been the last couple of days, um, it's full of children paddling. Um, so this is a space where families come and picnic and, um, uh, uh, you know, I hope they're going to see something. Some of the nannies just turn up with towels and don't even pretend they're going to see the collection, but we don't yeah. mind. Um, <laughs> next slide, please. Um, here you can see our new entrance on Exhibition Road. This is the largest porcelain courtyard in, um, in Europe. Um, and th this allows us to flow on to um, Exhibition Road. Opposite us, you can see the Science Museum and the Natural History Museum. So this idea really of a kind of uh, a piazza, a, a cultural uh, a quarter. We have performances here and events uh, here. You can see, interestingly, the, the royal crest in the middle of the, of, of the gates. And it, we always think it's very important that we're not a state institution, even though we are funded partly uh, by government. We, we, we have this royal uh, foundation. So governments come and go, but we, we keep going. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here you can just see some of the collection and here are wonderful sculpture and again an incredible um, Italian collection uh, because many, many of the um, uh, curators in the, in, in the mid to late 19th century when 
Italy was suppressing many of its religious organizations and monasteries, uh, went and acquired uh, uh, great works um, here. Next slide, please. And then this is the so this is the storehouse in East London. So this is a new facility, an open access facility that anyone can come to and what we what we call order an object. So if you are passionate about late 17th century ceramics and there is a bowl that you want to see which is not on display you will be able to order it it will be brought to you at a desk and you can have uh, an object session uh, there um, you will yeah. also be able to experience this space um, as, a, as a kind of visitor uh, attraction we have this idea of what are called hacked ends. So it's a kind of working environment because it's also, you know, where loans are going in and loans are coming out. And it provides us with the, with the capacity to, to build, to, to open up some of our historic rooms. What the v &A has always done is acquire these kind of architectural fragments and these historic rooms, uh, like this, this Torios ceiling, you can see the, the sort of background of um, on the right. So this will be open in 2024, and we're really excited by that. You know, this is a lovely idea, Tristram, because you may go to a museum and there are certain exhibitions on display or certain objects on display, but your interest may lie elsewhere, or especially for researchers. And this is just a lovely way of, of throwing open the storage and the collections to people to make it much more accessible. This really is about accessibility. That's, it, that's exactly right. In, in a part of London, which has not been well served by museums, mm -hmm. um, and in, in, in the UK, we often talk about, you know, what's happening outside London, some of the challenges there, but within London itself, there, there's an inequality uh, in terms of the provision of culture. Um, next slide, please. And then here you can see um, Young V&A. This used to be, this was the Bethnal Green Museum founded in 1872. Um, and it, had many iterations and it became the Museum of Childhood, which was really a museum of the social history of childhood. Um, and truth be told, parents and grandparents really enjoyed going around it, seeing the, the toys of their childhood. So it was an area where almost nostalgia overcame the collections. And what I wanted to do was say, no, this has to be for children and families. How do we use our collections to encourage play, imagination, storytelling, design, creation. And so we've stripped it all out and we're creating these new galleries based around play, imagination um, and design um, in uh, a part of East London with a very strong Bangladeshi and Bengali heritage uh, community who love this space and are very connected to this space. But I always felt that we were underserving them. Um, actually, there was more we could do to push those uh, mm -hmm. families and visitors to, to really stretch their creative muscles. And the more we know about early years, the more important it is that young people learn to play um, and play with their parents. And so if I could, Camille, I would, I would ban parents from bringing their phones in. They have to get on their hands and knees and play with their children <laughs> and, and use the collection. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then here you see V&A Dundee, designed by the Japanese architect Kengo Kuma, um, and part of this, you know, remarkable regeneration of the of the uh, uh, around the River Tay in Dundee. Mm -hmm. British cities turned their backs on their waterways for for for, for so long, um, and this was all about bringing the city back to the water, uh, and then creating an amazing civic space where the v &A collection with the Scottish heritage is on show, uh, is on public access, as well as great uh, exhibition space. Lovely. Shruti, I think you can stop sharing now, yeah? Thank you. Okay. So what sounds like a really exciting development in all this is the collaboration with the Smithsonian, because you actually have two museums coming together to share collections, ideas, curatorial skills, and ultimately audiences. And that's the way forward, right? The idea of sharing rather than constantly acquiring. It is, um, and, and, and it was a great collaboration. Unfortunately, um, and, I, and it's my fault, I should have um, um, sent you the, the information here. Um, COVID sort of killed the collaboration. Um, yeah, that, Tristan, that, that, that sounds that, terrible. That the, 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 partner, the, the kind of official partnership um, with, the, with the Smithsonian, uh, because they took such a financial 
hit through the uh, pandemic uh, mm -hmm. meant that it, it was impossible to, to take forward in that form. But your, your broader point, in, mm -hmm. in a global cultural environment, particularly for a museum like the V&A, with global collections, many of them with colonial and imperial uh, histories, we absolutely have to be in, in the practice and habit of proactive sharing in terms of collections and curatorial and conservation um, uh, knowledge. And one, one, as, as we're you know, experiencing today, one, one of the great advantages of the digital revolution is the ability to share collections uh, digitally. Um, and, and our ambition over the coming years is to grow to many millions um, of our, our, our kind of online traffic, but MAP, uh, you know, leading the way uh, in this space. And I can only pray, pay tribute to you and your, um, your team. Um, but we also know nothing beats being in front of the object itself. Um, and so we are we're very passionate uh, about either sending our exhibitions around the world or working on um, strategic partnerships. And, and obviously uh, in India with yourself, with our, with our, our, our great friends at the, uh, the Baldaj Lad uh, Museum, and, um, who, who, which was a very, very long time ago. And it was the first Victorian Albert Museum. They, they, they had the name up before us. Uh, because the South Kensington Museum only became the VNA uh, in 1899, um, and and obviously the the, um, the what was the Prince of Wales Memorial Museum uh, and now the CSMVS. Um, so all of these partnerships are really really important um, for us, and and I think it's a it's a particularly exciting time um, in South Asia and in India for, for for the new museums which are beginning and the new partnerships that are available. Yeah, well. Talking about partnerships, I listened to this very provocative podcast by Malcolm Gladwell, where he speaks of museums and their acquisitions and how they hold thousands of objects that will probably never see the light of day, and yet they spend millions more acquiring newer objects. How do you view the role of the museum as a guardian of culture and heritage and balancing that with the need to stay contemporary rather than acquisitive? It's, it's such a big challenge because by our statute mm -hmm. we are not allowed to deaccession items from the collection i.e we're not allowed to remove items from the collection unless they're permanently damaged unless they're an exact replica or unless they go to another national museum in the uk where they can go um, um now we're allowed to lend lots of things and and and, and all the rest of it so this leads to big challenges around questions around restitution and repatriation Mm -hmm. But it also leads to, you know, the incredible accumulation of material. And on the one hand, that's quite good because we have instances, not least our South Asian plaster casts, which were destroyed in the 1930s, because at that time, the trustees felt they were of no value. So trustees and directors are not allowed to destroy or eliminate artifacts, which is, you know, to the good. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, frankly, there is room for some housekeeping here. There is room for deaccessioning and removing items from our collection, but legally we're prevented from doing that at the moment. So we're growing and our collection strategy has mm -hmm. to be um, you know, focused on ensuring that you know, great works of 19th century ivory or remarkable 16th century books mm -hmm. join the collection, as well as thinking about you know, we just acquired an amazing Kahinda Wiley portrait of a, of, of, of a young woman of colour from East London because he was riffing off the William Morris wallpaper, which he'd seen in the VNA. So that was a connection to the collection. So we, we absolutely have to, you know, uh, we have to keep our collection policy up to date and exciting um, and, and relevant whilst, you know, mm -hmm. being kind of smart about building on our existing strengths. But everything costs money. And what we're trying to think about now is the lifetime costs of an acquisition, because it's not just buying it or the transport, mm -hmm. it's the storage costs. It's the on storage costs for a very long time that we, that we have to be really careful about now. Mm. The VNA, like the British Museum and several others around the world, was the result of imperialist impulses. And one of the founding collections came from the East India Company. In fact, you have a prized uh, possession of Tipu's tiger, which I assure you many Indians eye very wistfully every time they visit the VNA. 
But it's interesting to examine the cultural impact of colonialism on the colonized, not only in terms of the loss of cultural markers, but also in terms of the legacy. In the cultural space, for example, it left us with a colonial lens through which we viewed our own heritage. And, and in many ways, it exists even today. For example, if you look at how British in India foregrounded certain kinds of art as classical art, while art as an practice that was often thousands of years old was dismissed as craft. So what are your thoughts on this very troubled relationship? I, th I think, um... I think the most important thing is, mm -hmm. is for it to be discussed and debated and analyzed and researched. I think we should be totally transparent um, about the origins of our collection. And you're absolutely right that the, the East India Company repository, which became the India Museum, then formed part of the foundations uh, of the collection of, of, uh, um, of the v &A. Mm -hmm. uh, And we have much more work to do in, in, in being kind of transparent about that. Within that, it, it becomes complicated because some of that will go back to, you know, loot um, and forcible imperial acquisitions. Some of it will be purchases by uh, colonial actors, forced or unforced. Some of it will be cultural gifts. It, and you begin with the object as museums. You begin with the history of the object and work forwards um, from that. But the broader intellectual point you know, the East India Company repository had a hierarchy of knowledge of defining through Asiatic societies and others an architecture of, of knowledge based upon a kind of, you know, James Mill enlightenment idea, which was highly racialized. And we need to understand and appreciate that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, and this is, I, th I think this is the, the brilliance of your critique, on the one hand, you have individuals like Lockwood Kipling, who are very passionate about exploring the history of art and design within South Asia, but are also classifying it within that, that craft tradition, um, which then sometimes within a European context is being downgraded, even though at the moment, you know, we might be more interested in that than, than some other traditions. So it's also, I think, what I'm trying to say is it's also quite sort of, as it were, how we're analyzing those histories is also changing with the times. But we, we have to be as, as rigorous and scholarly and open and transparent about the prehistories of the collections because the public are more and more interested in provenance, in the history of collections and in understanding that alongside um, just the traditional design stories. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, I don't like to invite you, Tristram, to walk us through five artworks in the V&A collection that speak to you in a more personal way. Wonderful. I, I think we're going to begin um, in the Raphael um, uh, Court. Uh, here we are, the Raphael Court. Th this is a remarkable space at the heart of the museum. Um, the Raphael cartoons, um, uh, and they're called cartoons because they're drawings on paper, they're cartoons, um, were uh, commissioned by Pope Leo X for the tapestries for the Sistine Chapel. Um, and these were Raphael's cartoons, which would then become the, which we then used by the weavers of, uh, of Bruges to create the tapestries, uh, which, which hung alongside the works of Botticelli and, uh, and Michelangelo. Um, and, King Charles I, back in the early 1600s, acquired these, and they remained in the royal collection uh, up until Queen Victoria. Um, and Albert, Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, was a, was a passionate um, enthusiast for the work of Raphael, not simply as an artist, but as a designer, as a craftsman. Um, and after Albert's death, Queen Victoria gifted these collections. Well, she didn't gift them, actually. She lent them to us. Uh, and they're still on loan from, from the Royal Collection uh, to hang in a space which is curiously the same space um, as the Sistine Chapel. Um, and so they tell the lives of St. Peter um, and St. Paul. If we go to the next slide. Um, and... During lockdown, we, we opened the frames. They're, they're, these are 500 years old. We opened the frames because we were relighting and rehanging. And the color um, that is still there and the skill and the draftsmanship and the physicality and everything that Raphael brings to it 
Um, these, for a long time, were the most important works in British art history, you know, on, on, on UK soil. And what we also did was this work you can see on the left, we, uh, we did this photogrammetry and this, this 3D uh, imaging of the collection. And to be up close to, to, the, to the paper, which sort of Raphael's hand would have pressed on, um, or, or his studio, uh, was, was a kind of wonderful moment. So I love these for the, as, as works, as perhaps amongst the greatest works of the High Renaissance, uh, but also as a kind of foundation uh, element of um, the v &A collection. Tristan, before you move on, I want you to explain the, the Raphael cartoon bit again, because when most of us hear cartoons, you know what we're thinking of. So, yeah. so why? So it, 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 it really just means large paper, uh, because there are works on paper. Um, and, 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 and that's the, that's the etymology Origin of it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so from, 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 from the Italian. Okay. And Christ's charge to Peter is, is when he's handing him the keys. Exactly. To the, exactly. Keys to exactly. Him. Okay. And, and what's very interesting about this is that, um, when, when the, the tapestry weavers in, 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 in Bruges saw this, they thought, oh, this is very boring. And so they added all of these amazing colored stars to Christ's white tunic. Um, and so the tapestry, so uh, the tapestry is a much, because they just wanted to show off. So the tapestry is a much more colorful version uh, of this initial cartoon. Um, but it's, um, uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, and, and we have at the other end of it, we have a Perugino, who was obviously Raphael's great tutor. Uh, and you what? see some of the, um, uh, the, 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 you see what he learned. Lovely. Okay. Go to the next. So this is the, um, this is one of the greatest carpets of the world. This is the Ardabil carpet, uh, which was woven in the 1670s in Ardabil, uh, Persia, Monday, Iran. Um, there's one at the V&A, there's another at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art in, mm -hmm. in California. Um, I mean, I adore it for it as a work of art. Um, I, I, I'm kind of always mesmerized by the enormity um, of it. And having traveled to um, Iran, it's, you know, it's such a shame uh, that, that, that we don't see more works from Iran at the moment. But I particularly like it as well because William Morris, the great designer and British socialist and, and co-founder of the V&A in many ways, um, can, was the man who convinced the director of the V&A to purchase this at auction in the 1880s. Um, and the director of the V&A said, no, 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 it's far too expensive, we're not buying. And, then, um, and he convinced him to buy it um, because William Morris um, and Owen Jones and so many of the, de the designers of the 19th century were so influenced by Persian design and were so excited by it. And I think it, it, it raises all of this question of cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. You know, they were seeking to have this enter the collection because they wanted designers in Britain to be inspired by Persian art and craft. Uh, and that was, that was the reason why Morris felt it was so important that it should be acquired. Now that you tell the story of uh, you, William Morris, insisting that this be acquired, there were some stories I read in the Viennese history where one of its curators went off, loved a lot of Italian things and went off to Italy and bought a whole lot of Donatello. And, and then they said off with his head and he was sacked and then brought back again. I mean, this all sounds quite amusing. No, you, there, was this, there was this sort of tussle really in, in, in the latter half of the 19th century between this idea that the v &A should be a museum of manufacture, that what we should put on display is great works of kind of pewter and ceramics and textiles, which are being made by factories in you know, Manchester and Stoke and elsewhere to encourage designers. And then a slightly different idea that we should be this broader museum of art and design, whereby the greatest works of art and design could encourage contemporary uh, makers. And so a, a, a brilliant man called um, uh, JC Robinson, this curator, went off particularly to Italy, again, because of the financial crisis and religious changes uh, and acquired and acquired and acquired it's, you know massively overspent the budget uh, and he got sacked but it was but then he, he he was sort of brought back again so you you have this tension between a slightly kind of utilitarian function for the museum and then this more aesthetic function okay 
Next. Here, I just wanted to show you some of our, our, our Fabergé eggs, which are on display at the moment. This is a slight cheat because this is an um, exhibition and um, this, this ends next weekend. I was walking around it this morning and I, uh, I was kind of, I was skeptical of Fabergé, but when you see the delicacy of the craftsmanship, when you see the phenomenal skill and the, um, the, the the sort of the attention and the brilliance and 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 then the stories around it and I suppose it, it points to this point about objects and the meaning of objects and how objects have both this kind of geopolitical history this design history but these are love gifts between the czar and the czarina between the emperor and his children and so even though they assume this kind of enormity within, within, within the history of, of design and Fabergé, thinking about Tsar Nicholas and thinking about um, the Romanovs and the family and, and then how they it, sort of through this culture of gifting express their, their love and affection for one another via Fabergé, um, it becomes much more interesting. Um, and the, the, the public respond to it you know, in, in huge numbers. Yeah, there's also, there's a great sense of fun about exhibitions like this as well. Everyone wants to see them. Everyone wants to, everyone wants to see it. And, and it's lovely actually. And it's sort of, and I fear because of what's happening in the world, we, we won't see these eggs again in the UK for a, a couple of generations. Um, so oh. um, it's, it, 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 it was, you know, we're, we're very lucky in the, in, in, in the roles we are being able to see some of these artifacts. And nothing like a good love story. Nothing like a, but also a doomed love story as well. <laughs> Next, please. So as, as, as you kindly mentioned, I've, I've just written a biography of Josiah Wedgwood, the great pottery designer from Stoke-on-Trent. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm passionate about this man who, who famously wanted to take on China at China, who wanted um, to really sort of, um, challenge the global ceramics industry, displace Chinese porcelain with English um, earthenware. And, and he succeeded uh, for a long time. But he was also a great progressive. I call him the radical potter. And he was a passionate abolitionist um, campaigning for the abolition of the trade in slaves. And he did what he did best, which was provide a design contribution. And he he created this um, uh, medallion, this 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 jasper, jasper was this new ceramic product he, 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 he um, founded. Um, and, and here we have a black relief on a white jasper background of an enslaved uh, African figure with the legend, am I not a man and a brother? Um, and whilst I think many of us would have hesitations today about the racialized depiction uh, of the enslaved African, mm. this was the, um, I mean, this was like the kind of CND badges or Extinction Rebellion and the UK, you know, the, you, you wore this as a symbol. We'd call it virtue signaling. You wore this as a symbol of your virtue. And it became part of this great mass movement uh, for the end in the trade in slaves and was an important part um, of that civil society campaign for abolition. It's tiny, uh, but really, really powerful. And you can see on the right of this picture, we've been working with students um, in Stoke-on-Trent for them to respond to this image and think about designing their own anti-racism images today. And, and that worked through a series of workshops really successfully. Yeah. Since we're discussing this, the museums are increasingly becoming one of the arenas for debate on cultural representation. And cultural groups are challenging them on the control they've traditionally had over interpretations and the ownership of ethnographic collections. The v &A is facing its own challenges with the Magdala treasures, which were taken from Ethiopia in the 1860s. I, I know that, you know, that you've spoken about the laws that govern, govern uh, return of objects, but the SAR Savoy report perhaps was the first step in a new direction and both Germany and France are talking of returning the Benin bronzes. What is the v &A stand on this? So the, the v &A stand is to, be as proactive as we can be within the limits of the law. Um, mm -hmm. 
And so whether it's our Magdala collection, which was looted from Ethiopia in 1868, whether it's our court regalia from Kumasi in Ghana, which was bought at auction, but results from looting in the 1870s, uh, uh, um, whether it's some, some, some other items, not a huge array of items, but mm. some, some other ones, we connect with um, governments, museums, cultural institutions in source countries to think about how we can develop partnerships which result in the long-term loan of these items. And then um, colleagues in Ethiopia and Ghana quite rightly say, oh, you know, hold on, why do we have to, you know, borrow from you the stuff you stole from us? Um, and we say, well, under the limits of the law, that's all we can do at the moment. And actually, um, you know, we've, we've got much more work to do in this and it's hard work because mm -hmm. you know we were making progress in Ethiopia and then the civil war uh, took place and so that's gone a bit quiet at the moment we're beginning to make pro progress in Ghana but we've got more work to do at our end there and it to my mind it's not just about the objects the objects are very very important um in and of themselves but it's about the partnerships around you know, curatorial skill, conservation skill, us learning from them, them learning from us and building up those longer term uh, partnerships. Um, so, so that's our policy, which is A, to be transparent about the past, um, uh, B, uh, to, to engage with um, source communities and countries and then build up um, long term loan uh, processes. Yeah, I suppose sharing or long term loans is one answer to that, because communities need to have access to cultural symbols that, you know, that are part of their history. But, but the debate is not just restricted to representation or restitution today. Museums are being asked by citizens to respond to issues of social and political injustice, as we have recently seen in the Black Lives Matter movement. Again, the VNA has faced public anger over the Sackler family's support to the museum. So how are you walking that tightrope? It's, it's really difficult to know what to do in these situations. I mean, I think it goes back to the beginning of our conversation. As, mm -hmm. as, as public institutions, we're, we're, we're being held to account. And politics has shifted. Politics now is much more around identity and culture and heritage um, and sexuality. And, and, and so museums, which deal with all of these issues in their collections, um, are are having to wrestle um, with this and, and, and you know, we'll get it right and we'll get it wrong. Um, but I think we, we've got to be open to the conversation. That means open on social media, it means open in, in, in press and, and the public realm and funding, a bit from the Sacklers or, you know, from BP or from, um, you know, coal conglomerates is, um, is, is all part of that. Um, we need to raise money. We, we, we're, we're a, you know, 50% of our income has to be um, self-generated. Uh, and so we do have sponsors. Um, and some of those are, you know, uh, can through the course of their sponsorship life then attach um, a public opprobrium and, 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 and problems and, 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 and then it rolls back to the um, institution. So, I mean, with the Sacklers, they're, they're no longer uh, uh, giving money to cultural institutions and, mm -hmm. and we think that's, that's the right decision. We respect that decision and, and, that, and that's where it sits at the moment. Okay. I can still see the medallion up on our screens. Maybe we should stop sharing, but I'd like to come back to this idea of writing. And, and I, I don't know how you had the time, Tristram, but you actually came up with another book during the pandemic in the middle of all these projects that are going on, the Radical Quarter. So do you want to tell us about that? So that, that was this, this project I'd long, long been involved with because um, I was Member of Parliament for, um, for Stoke-on-Trent Central. Um, and Wedgwood is this extraordinary figure who obviously uh, uh, creates um, uh, the potteries as, as, as we know them uh, today. Um, and uh, I became very, very interested in Wedgwood um, as, as a man and, and, and a designer and a marketeer and a progressive and a radical, supports the American Revolution, the French Revolution. But the business was in, was in terrible trouble when I, when I arrived in Stoke-on-Trent. It had gone into liquidation. So I also wanted to trace the kind of rise and fall of this, this incredible company, but then this collapse. And really what's so interesting is it's a story of globalization. 
that as Britain enters onto the world stage in the in the 1700s, Wedgwood kind of surges forward uh, and is this incredible figure gaining markets, partly through colonialism, partly through market conquest. But then when um, China and the Far East and, and South Asia through globalization in the late 20th century kind of surge back onto the world stage in terms of economic uh, prowess, it absolutely destroys the British ceramics um, industry. Um, and so this, this story of the kind of um, the tides and waves of globalization told through ceramics, through, you know, uh, the six towns of Stoke-on-Trent was what excited me. Anyway, I've been in my mind for a long time. I've done some work on it. I've done work here and there. Uh, and then uh, the pandemic arrived, lockdown arrived. There were no longer any more excuses for not writing it. Uh, so, so, you know, if you know what it's like being in a museum. There's, there's lots of activities, there are morning events, evening events, all of that died. So I had my, you know, my Zoom calls during the day, but then suddenly I had I had time at the beginning and end of the day to write it. I thought it's no, I thought this is not going to happen again for quite a while. So I, I needed to, to seize the opportunity. It's been a really tough two and a half years for most of us, especially in the museum world, because there was a way we engaged with our audiences and we were just forced to completely change that way. I mean, it turned everything on its head. What are the learnings that you have taken away from this time? It, it has been a difficult um, few years. Um, and I think we're still kind of processing some of the implications um, of it. I think we've all learned that what one can work in different ways. Um, I think the world has changed, you know, um, people are just, you know, London has lost a million residents uh, because either because of, you know, people have gone home, Brexit, but also people have moved out because they're just, you can work from home two, three days a week. You know, the, there has been this kind of COVID plus the digital revolution has just shifted the world in terms of the sort of, you know, the, the, many of the Western um, economies. And we've got to reflect on that. And so there are lots of kind of digital learnings, but I also learned just how important museums are, which I always felt as public civic spaces where people congregate are present with one another together in front of objects of great beauty. And so the, in a sense, it underlined what we've always known about museums and the importance of museums in our, in our lives. Um, and when they were taken away, that sense of, that sense of loss. I mean, not just, you know, I was coming into the VNA, you know, most days because we had to manage it, but, you know, the, I've, I've got old friends in the National Gallery and the British Museum and, you know, the Wallace Collection, who I like to go uh, and see, and I couldn't see them. And they were, and, and so I think we all felt this, this sense of loss. So it underlined the, the fundamental importance of the essential core mission of museums alongside all of these bits around um, the edges that, that we've learned. Yeah, because I, I, I know when the, when the pandemic hit all of us where, you know, there was a quandary, what do you do, how do you go forward, and then of course we decided to go digital and launch digitally, but, but ultimately I think there's something so powerful about a physical space, and also I think we discovered the, the idea of, of, of how art can help people heal, so there was a lot of that, a lot of people came, came to the museum just to, just to feel better or to communicate with art or you don't contemplate or reflect. No, and we, we, we saw that, that, that picture we saw earlier of the Raphael Court, yeah. and we've got these lovely new benches in it. And it's a, it's a sort of semi-spiritual space uh, for, for Christians. Um, and, and, and so you did have that sense of, of, of just a kind of, you know, the, the awe and the aura of the object lost none of their potency during the pandemic. Okay. So... I just want to, I think people need also one human element to understand Tristram Hunt. If you had to go away on a holiday, Tristram, what would that be? If you needed a break of all oh, of this, wow. where would you be or what would you do? Um, do you know what? I would, um, <laughs> the, 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 there are lots of, I would, I'm, I'm desperate to come back um, to, to India. Um, oh. I'm desperate um, to, um, I've spent so many, happy and important times um, in India. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that in the new year. But I think here in, in the UK, um, I'd go to wet and windy Devon uh, in, the, in the west of the country and go uh, walking um, on coastal walks 
uh, with my children uh, who would be complaining uh, and I'll be telling them it was good for them. Um, so uh, uh, having, and, and, and it's always raining in Devon and there's a strong wind and it just kind of blows the cobwebs uh, away, um, which is um, which is important. So so that would be my that would be my call. <laughs> Spoken like a true Britisher because I remember <laughs> we had little books on learning in, in in India. They would say Pat put on his hat and went for a walk. It was a bright sunny day, and every day in India is a bright sunny day. So we would always wonder why was that <laughs> something to be remarked about. And then of course we realized <laughs> okay, <laughs> they're talking about the British weather. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So let, I think it's time for a few quick questions, Tristram. So let me, I'm pulling up some questions on our Q&A. Um, and there's Richard Hughes here who says, the B&A plaster, uh, plaster cast gallery is fantastic. Can this be brought up to date as a way of new sharing and international collaboration? I think it's, 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 um, it's such an interesting idea because the plaster casts are, mm -hmm. you know, this, this great innovative, um, you know, process of reproduction so that working people who couldn't go to Florence or Rome or Pisa or Venice and see the great works of sculpture um, could see them for themselves in, in South Kensington. And today, and we saw a bit with the Raphael cartoons, that the technology that is now available for 3D printing, for scanning, for reproduction, led by people like Adam Lowe at Facta Marte, who, you know, famously sort of reproduced Veronese's wedding feast at Cana, which had been stolen from Venice, taken to, uh, to Paris, and, and, and he's put it back in its place um, in, in, in the monastery in San Giorgio um, in, in Venice. I think people like Adam Lowe are bringing the spirit of the, um, uh, the cast courts up to, up to date. Um, and, and I think we will see more reproductions. And that will change again the conversation around, you know, sharing objects and sculptures and 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 um, and, and you know, you do see more reproductions now in in museum exhibitions, um, e e even in in galleries. So I think with, with every passing year, the technology gets better, and 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 the ability to share becomes more. And then we get into the old conversation about, you know, where is the where is the ore? Is it with the original or is it with the reproduction? Ah, okay. There's another question from P. Mehta. She says, good evening. What was the reason to join the museum after working in various different areas? Do you think we need more activities in the museums for the benefit of art and artists all over the world? So two questions. I, I, I mean, I think um, what one of the, you know, I mean, it's not new, new, but I think we see a, a really exciting engagement with historic collections by contemporary artists now. Um, mm -hmm. And just thinking, you know, we, we wonderfully we met uh, in Venice and thinking about um, the work of uh, Anish Kapoor, which is in the Academia um, in, in, in Venice, that mm -hmm. lots of contemporary makers and designers and artists, A, want to be in amongst historic collections, and B, want to reflect upon them um, and engage with them. And so our contribution at the Venice Biennale was a film by a Qatari filmmaker, um, uh, Sofia al Nahria, um, who made a film about Tipu's tiger um, and, and, and thinking about its meaning for her and its sort of post-colonial um, legacies. So we're, we're always open to working with contemporary artists and designers and actually feel it's, it's part of our responsibility to ensure that the collections are available for them to challenge, interrogate, hack, reinterpret, all, all of those uh, important components. Um, so I, I think that's yeah, a vital part of what we do. In fact, we saw quite a bit of that in Venice because we saw Anselm Kiefer as well in the Palace Ducal again, responding to the various masters there. And uh, I saw another Vietnamese um, artist in the Museum Pore, who had also, you know, interacted again with, with the Madonna of Mercies, I think. So quite interesting to see that, that movement now. Um, do you want to answer her first question about the- Oh, sorry, politics. Yes. I, <laughs> uh, it, it, it was push and pull. I mean, I was a historian um, before I was involved in, in, in politics and I was always interested in public engagement with history. So heritage and, um, and, 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 and the museum world. Um, I enjoyed my time in politics, but then 
uh, two things happened. One, uh, Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party and I didn't uh, agree with him. Um, and then my constituency voted very heavily for, for, for Brexit and I didn't agree with that. So um, I, I felt my, my days were probably numbered um, and, and <laughs> I, I, I wanted... I was always in opposition. I was I was like the Congress Party. I was kind of you know the Labour Party. We we didn't we didn't have we didn't have power. Um, and so your ability to actually deliver change, and I could see that not. I, I could see sort of you know as a politician you have a you know life expectancy, and you know there's always a new generation coming. So I felt my I felt my timing in politics was unfortunate, and rather than becoming aggrieved and disappointed by that, I thought I should cut my losses uh, and move on. And I was very, very lucky uh, that I, uh, I applied and had oh, you know, five, six interviews for this role, but I was lucky to be, to be able to join the v &A. Okay, so Katie Tompkins um, asked, she's referencing the Raphael cartoons and wants to know, are they on one large sheet? I mean, no, I'm mean, oh, sorry. So, so, so no, that 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 on each each cartoon um, is is obviously a separate cartoon, uh, and then they're all the sheets are stuck together, mm -hmm. and then what you see is the pinholes in the sheets because then the sheets were taken apart uh, in order that the weavers uh, could then could, could could then dot out their design from it. Um, in order to make the tapestry, so they were uh, they were assembled and reassembled multiple times. Well, that's really interesting. Okay, so Valerie has a question here. Um, what represents the most challenging aspect of audience engagement at the VNA, and how does public opinion influence the shape of upcoming exhibitions? Um, that's a very good question. We we we. It's 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 kind of like an editor of a new, of, of a newspaper. The, the 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 exhibition point that you you you. It's up to you to think what will be interesting. We don't put ideas out for focus groups, or you you, you kind of make a call about what you think will will work, um, and also what you think is important, and also what you think connects to the collection, um, and. I, I appeal for, for, for prospective exhibitions from my colleagues in, in the museum. Uh, they kind of pitch them to me. We then work out what, what, what we think will, uh, will work. Um, and to my mind, you've got to have this mix of the popular, um, which are going to bring the numbers in, which will then cross subsidize the more esoteric and, and, uh, and the more scholarly. Um, and, you know, some will succeed and some will flop. Um, and, and we're lucky at the VNA. We can we can soak up uh, some of the failures, but you can't have you can't have too many flops, uh, or else the trustees <laughs> begin, begin. They were, you know what trustees are like. They always say, "Oh no, have the confidence. Doesn't matter. You know, have the, until it goes wrong. At which point, you know, things, <laughs> things change." Um, so so the, and 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 I think um, you know, whilst I'm, I consult heavily with colleagues and talk to colleagues, ultimately this, this full, it's, it's one of the jobs that falls to the director that you are in charge of the programme and the programme kind of reflects your ambitions and sensibilities along with all of the financial constraints and that, that, that come with it. Yeah, I think it's finding that balance between the financial constraints and then what is, what, what is the audience demand and then again, curatorial, narratives you know it's, it's a balance of all of that so they were, we are not just talking to ourselves but we are talking to a wider audience so i think the let me ask you the last question which is what we have time for tristram which is someone says a fascinating conversation but I, and i am a teacher at a 165 year old school in bangalore i'm setting up a museum to showcase the history of my school and would be grateful for some advice oh my god that's a bit difficult but i anyway, think that's for you that's not for me that's <laughs> <laughs> I think that's right. I, uh, I have no advice to give apart from, I think, for a museum like that, you want to really, you want to begin dating with a kind of public call and, and that, that, that online connection, um, which will then surface um, the, the, um, uh, the histories. And then I think picking out, you know, five 
signal moments in the last 165 years, which then speak to the broader truth about the institution. Um, and whether that's around, you know, world wars or independence or gender equality or, you know, it, that, those sort of, those moments. And then if one's lucky, one finds an object which encapsulates that. Uh, and then, uh, um, and, and, and I think with museums, the, the object is, is, is so important. Oh, that's wonderful advice. And I think also to try and see how your whatever story that you have to tell is relevant to today's audiences who come who enter your museum. So Tristan, we're at the end of the hour. So I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's, it's a difficult day to do a conversation because it's the opening of the India Art Fair today. But I'd really say how grateful we, uh, we are to you for, for talking to us and for giving us this really exciting view of, of your career and your journey in the British, uh, in the VNA. Oops, the VNA. Really? Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wonderful to talk to you, and I look forward to welcoming as many of you as possible to the VNA, either online or, or here at South Kensington. But it's been wonderful, and best of luck with all the work at MAP, which I think is, is pioneering, uh, with, you know, hugely impressive. Thank you, Tristan. We look forward to welcoming you to India soon. Exactly. Good night. Wonderful. Thank you Take all care. for watching.